Yes. Let's go. Okay. So hello everyone. Welcome to the keynote session. But before we start, let me um, go again with the same uh, uh, preliminary information we give in any uh, big event. So this Zoom meeting is being recorded for later rebroadcast within the conference. Uh, you should see the record signal on your screen. Uh, it is set to record only the active camera and shared screens. So it is also being live, live streamed on YouTube and the video will remain available during, uh, during, uh, until the end of the week. In this week, uh, we will have a pre uh, in this meeting. Sorry, we will have a presentation from uh, Dr. Sefia Noble. That will be it's a forty-five minute presentation, and it will be followed by a moderated question period. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, keep your microphone muted and use the Zoom chat window to send chat message to myself or everyone with Q and a keyword to request a turn of speak. Uh, a turn to speak or type out the whole question for the moderator to read it to you. I will select as many responses as we have time for. Uh, please attend carefully for your turn to unmute and be mindful of the other participants waiting to share. Um, so note that the Q&A will not, will not be live streamed. So for this keynote presentation, we are very honored uh, to host Dr. Safia Novo. And I have to say that I'm person, I personally feel very, very privileged to be introducing her, since if there was such a thing as a Dr. Noble fan club, with no doubt I'd be one of the, its most active and dedicated members. So Dr. Sophia Umoja Noble is an associate professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, in the Department of Information Studies, where she serves as a co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. She also holds appointments in African American Studies and Gender Studies. She is a research associate at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford and has been appointed as a commissioner on the Oxford Commission on AI and Good Governance. She is a board member of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. vulnerable to online harassment. Also, subject plenary, marking the way that digital media impacts and intersects with issues of race, gender, culture, and technology. She is regularly quoted for her expertise on issues on algorithmic discrimination and technology bias by national and international press. Recently, she was named in the top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers of 2019 by Government Technology Magazine. Dr. Noble is the co-editor of two edited volume, The Intersectional Internet, Internet, Race, Sex, Culture, and Class Online and Emotions, Technology and Design. Uh, she holds a PhD in MS in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a BA in Sociology from California State University, Fresno, where she was recently awarded Distinguished Alumni Award uh, for 2018. So I'm not sure I mentioned that she was the author of Algorithms of Oppression, a really wonderful book that I encourage all of you to read if you haven't done so yet. So the title of our presentation today is Taking on Big Tech, New Paradigms for New Possibility. So please welcome uh, Safia Noble. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks to those of you who have your cameras on so I can see your face. It's so amazing. I don't know how anyone is teaching these days. Um, I also, if you're past the first page of what I can see, you don't even have to turn your camera on because I can't see more than one page. So that's the upside. Um, if you keep your camera on, then I get to see you. So uh, I just want to say thanks so much for this opportunity while I get my screen here together. Um, it's really a thrill to get to share my work with you all and um, to be a part of such a distinguished um, <clears throat> conference. And Audrey, thank you so much for your kind words and um, just a great energy. 
Um, <clears throat> my husband told me to make sure that I don't tell this joke before we get started, which I feel like was him trying to say that I should tell you that my, um, <clears throat> my uh, kind of worst experience, best experience, depending on how you look at it, um, when I was in graduate school was almost getting kicked out by the Dean of Students for um, downloading BitTorrent music uh, on the campus network. So I don't know, that's, that's how I'm coming to this conversation. Um, <clears throat> of course, the work that you all do is so important in the world and I'm gonna not be talking specifically about um, music retrieval, but I think, um, because obviously you don't want to hear from me on those issues, but I do want to share with you kind of some things that are happening in the realm of the world that I study, which is kind of, you know, big technology platforms and really thinking about the kind of paradigm and the moment that we're in. And I hope that some of the things that I can share and the conversation that we can have will give us an opportunity to, again, like imagine new possibilities, imagine new paradigms um, other than maybe the ones that we've been in and, um, and certainly the ones that, that could come in the future. So some of the things that I'm gonna say will be provocative. It, it's a lot of pressure to say that I'm gonna take on big tech and then see um, Audrey's screen um, background with pretty much every company that I might be critiquing. Um, so I'm not winning as I jump into this talk today. But for those of you who are working in companies, I mean, this really, I do see my work as um, very much kind of in solidarity and allied with people who are working in industry, working in academia and nonprofits and community organizations where we are really challenged by a whole new, um, I don't know, landscape of um, technical systems that are having such a huge role in culture, in politics, in economics. Um, when I first started doing the work of uh, researching this, this book, this book, Algorithms of Oppression, you know, it began as kind of a PhD dissertation turned into a book. And I will tell you that 10 years ago, when I would say things like, um, <clears throat> you know, algorithms uh, are kind of over-determining uh, what happens to people, how knowledge and communities and ideas are represented and they're, they're misrepresenting people and communities in profound ways. I mean, there was just almost no one to hear, listen to that. Most people, in fact, when I was a graduate student a decade ago, would say, Sophia, it's impossible for um, AI or algorithms or code to discriminate because code is just math. And, you know, this kind of hyper reductionist way of thinking about computer science and AI and algorithms um, such that, you know, of course, when we're talking about these systems, we're not talking about code per se, although we could, um, we're talking about the social implications of code, right? The social implications of AI. And of course, in my field, um, like probably some of you coming out of the field of library science, um, information science, um, information retrieval, knowledge management, um, we know all of the kinds of subjectivities that are tied to the organization of knowledge, let's just say broadly under kind of a big tent um, concept. So it's important for us to be having these conversations as we think about how much more um, of our kind of agency is being lost in the ability to um, understand when big data sets or you know um, large uh, a large corpus of knowledge, let's say a huge you know library or entertainment um, uh, database um, is constantly um, being engaged in ways to make certain things visible, make other things less visible, the role that the, these play in shaping culture, so incredibly important. So again, I'm gonna stay in my zone, but I hope that some of the things that I talk about will be of benefit to you as you're thinking about kind of your zone. All right, so let's get started. Um, in 2018, you might recall this, um, seeing this word uh, emerge into existence. 
Um, the the uh, story of Cambridge Analytica uh, as it was breaking really prompted people outside of academia and industry to think much more carefully about the way in which systems were really <clears throat> so deeply implicated in um, leading people in new directions that maybe they hadn't thought about before, or in, in many cases, even in, uh, certainly in the case of Cambridge Analytica, kind of micro-targeting people um, to uh, <clears throat> predict or influence, uh, or in some cases, manipulate their behavior. And um, when that story broke, you know, this really, I think, uh, was an opening for thinking more critically about the role of big tech, big technology companies and platforms in um, society. And I thought this was so interesting that, um, can't, that uh, um, the Financial Times in 2018 declared this their word of the year. And you know, the Financial Times, I mean, that's the, the newspaper of capital, right? That's the newspaper of the 1%. So when the 1% are declaring a tech clash, then everybody else needs to probably um, wake up and pay attention because that's going to impact the way in which investing will um, uh, uh, take hold. And of course, <clears throat> now we have whole new cottage industries of scholars and um, people in industry who are thinking about um, AI and fairness, AI and ethics, justice, a lot of different kinds of words that are getting coupled up with AI or algorithms. <clears throat> I, I still, to this day, um, <clears throat> contend that we need to be thinking in terms of oppression and justice rather than, let's say, other words like bias and fairness. And I'm really um, <clears throat> interested in having that conversation with you. But part of that is how we frame um, the concerns um, will inevitably lead to the way in which we try to solve problems. So when I talk about big technology and the tech lash, I'm talking about it in the context of ever widening social, political, and economic inequality globally and in the United States. And what is the role of these systems in exacerbating, fomenting, um, deepening and widening these inequalities. <clears throat> That's a little bit different than talking about things like AI and um, bias, which is a more narrow conception of thinking about like how is data, where does data come from? How is data not um, uh, reflective of the communities that, it's, uh, that it represents? How do we unbiased data? Most of the conversations, for example, around AI and bias or AI um, <clears throat> and ethics, <clears throat> excuse me, often really foreground the technology rather than foregrounding the communities and the um, structural systems that people are living in. So this is an important distinction that I just wanna make up front so that you kind of understand how I'm oriented. And of course we, we can also talk about um, technical systems. <clears throat> I was particularly um, uh, pleased to see the way in which journalists um, over the past solidly five years uh, if not more have really started to take a hold um, of the work of um, mostly, I would say, women, women of color, people of color, LGBTQ scholars and activists uh, who really have been the people at the forefront of talking about algorithms and AI and social harm or political and economic harm. And I think one of the reasons why is because many of us, um, we hold these identities. We are already living in families, neighborhoods, communities that are um, hyper-targeted by um, bad technology or where technologies get kind of practiced upon our communities. So we're more aware in many ways. Um, you know, even though there are now, you know, films and people talking, um, for example, ex-industry people talking about the harms of technology, the things they didn't know they were doing, um, you know, <clears throat> for at least uh, 20 years, I will tell you, um, 
women of color in particular in the academy have been talking about the harms of technology and the ways in which these technologies and the logics that underpin them are organized in ways that have harmful effects. So this conversation is not new, but it is certainly now much more mainstream. And part of the mainstreaming has come about with kind of um, people who previously didn't see, um, who, who didn't see these issues starting to kind of open their eyes and notice. And that includes investors and former technology executives who are uh, kind of falling out of love with um, big tech too. Now, <clears throat> some of the people that I just wanna be, uh, you know, we're in this moment where we are, um, responding to calls for racial justice, particularly in the United States, uh, you know, in our calls for justice for Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, so many um, African Americans in particular who have been um, victims of state violence. And um, this is a really important moment, I think, to remind us that there are so many scholars who've been writing at the intersection of race and technology. And I know that many people have been asking us at UCLA at the Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, where I um, kind of um, co-direct our operations and our research team there. Um, people have been asking about how to <clears throat> be better educated about the issues. Um, that are happening in our society and where the tech sector touches these issues. And so these are some people that I want you to know about because I think they are um, amazing scholars that will deepen, far deepen than I can do in 45 minutes or so, the conversations and the knowledge. And I think especially I would call out um, my friend and colleague, Andre Brock here, who's a professor at Georgia Tech um, and his new book, Distributed Blackness, because his work is so much about um, digital culture and digital cultural aesthetics. And I think for anybody working um, in and around music, um, creative arts and culture, um, having these kind of sophisticated nuanced ways of understanding black aesthetic culture, for example, or popular culture would really, uh, I think you could um, glean a lot from his work. <clears throat> Sorry about this uh, frog in my throat. I would also point you to um, Kishana Gray, whose work, um, whose new book, book, Woke Gaming, is another one for people who are working kind of closely in the digital. Um, I know that many of you, your, your professional uh, work bleeds across, you know, many different kinds of um, creative arts industries. And so um, her work around social justice and gaming, I think is really um, interesting and fascinating. But all this to say that there are, there's a, a deep corpus um, that's building. Um, <clears throat> many of us gather as part of a, a group called the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. Uh, we convene out of New York University, out of NYU, under the leadership of Charlton McElwin here. Um, Professor McElwin wrote this um, amazing book, Black Software, which is actually a counter narrative of the way we've thought about places like Silicon Valley and the histories of the emergence of um, the software industries. So again, I think really kind of what it's cost us um, in terms of these um, dimensions of race and power in our society and the emergence of that industry. So I highly recommend his book. We have a, um, uh, plenty of resources and studies too that you can tap into. And I just offer that as a way to, again, deepen our knowledge and expertise. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the st original study that kind of kicked off um, the work that then became the book Algorithms of Oppression. And this is really just to orient you for um, those who aren't familiar. This, in fact, this story might even seem familiar to you that you already know it. And part of it is because I've really been talking about this story for a solid um, decade. Um, when I was in graduate school, I, was, I really went because I was interested in thinking about um, knowledge management and culture online. I've been on the internet since the late 80s. Um, I can tell you that uh, I'm old. There's a lot of hair dye here that you just leave it. Um, but this is one of the, you know, I've seen a lot of things happen on the internet because I've been on for so long. And um, certainly I remember um, a time when um, people were really interested in digitizing culture. 
and making um, culture available. In fact, I remember working um, a long time ago, gosh, I, I mean, this is in the 90s, um, in the kind of mid late 90s, I remember working at a company called Business for Social Responsibility in San Francisco. And uh, I had a colleague there who was doing things like preserving um, world music, like indigenous people's music and trying to digitize, digitize um, indigenous people's music before those indigenous cultures um, were lost before like at the last generation of people who were alive, who performed music in different cultures around the world. And I remember um, thinking uh, back then, I mean, he and I both thought how amazing the internet is and was um, in those early kind of days of being able to preserve and make that kind of art accessible. And, you know, here we are fast forward um, so many, you know, decades, quite frankly, later, so many years later, where <clears throat> the um, availability and the um, accessibility to different kinds of culture and cultural understanding about people is really highly automated. Um, it's uh, managed by very complex AI and algorithms that, um, in fact, I think many companies are not even always entirely sure exactly how they work. Um, they, you know, where people are trying to kind of mitigate when there are failures. And so I started, you know, um, my work kind of in that space. And I was looking to see how people and communities were represented in something like search engines. Now, part of the reason I was interested in search engines is because, um, is because uh, at the time that I entered graduate school, so many people were relating to commercial search engines as kind of like the new public library, right? As these new, this kind of new space of knowledge organization that was pr profoundly trans transforming the web. And of course, for all of us who were around kind of pre Lycos, pre Alta Vista, kind of pre search engines of those of that of that sort, it was kind of a mess. I mean, it was very difficult. It was a different kind of mess, let's just say. It was very difficult to um, find experts. Um, of course, there was more expertise in many ways, deep subject matter expertise. I mean, the first search engines, you know, we thought of them as virtual libraries. That's really how they were curated and managed and librarians were very involved. So while I was in information school here with all of these librarians, archivists, um, uh, computer scientists, um, doing my research and my studies, I was kind of surprised to see how much ground um, uh, information professionals like librarians had ceded to large commercial advertising platforms like Google. Now, Google, you know, just happened to be the object of study because they were the monopoly leader. I mean, when, when everyone uses your platform, you get studied the most. And certainly if, uh, you know, Yahoo had been the leader, I would have written the book. The colors would have been different. You know, the, the cover would have looked more like a, you know, something else. Um, so, you know, it's not really that it's particular um, necessarily to one company. It's more like that when you start getting to large scale knowledge organization, which of course Google's own kind of, you know, ethos was about organizing, you know, the, all the world's knowledge. Um, it becomes troublesome when you are in any kind of minoritized group. And so this, this, what you're looking at here is a search that I started kind of collecting these searches around what happens when you do keyword searches on vulnerable people. So I started by looking at black girls. Um, you know, I was thinking about my daughter, my nieces. I had been a black girl at one point in my life. I looked at Latina girls, Asian girls, you know, all different combinations. I probably had 80 different combination, keyword combinations, but over and over when I, when I'd look at girls of color, the results were just almost exclusively pornography or hypersexualized content. Um, now this is a sophisticated audience of music experts. I know. Um, uh, so you, you will see here that two of the results on this search from 2011, um, is a band of white guys from the UK who call themselves the black girls. 
And everywhere I go, I mean, I'm just, I so regret that we are not here together in person because everywhere I go, I, even when I'm in the UK, I ask people, have you ever heard of the band called the white girl? I mean, called the black girls and, um, uh, no one ever raises their hand. I mean, they're just like, no, don't know what that is. And so it's shocking to me how, um, exceptional they are at search engine optimization and terrible at music distribution. So somebody should really grab a hold of the black girls too on this call because I talk about them every time I give a talk. So really, I am I really am promoting the black girls hard. Um, so this is kind of you know a, a way in of looking at how. Um, vulnerable children, in this case, children of color, are misrepresented so profoundly in something like search. And of course, this was the case for many years. Um, I, uh, I have been writing about it and talking about it for a very long time, like I said, close to a decade. Um, and, uh, and of course, now, you know, Google has responded and has really suppressed the pornography for the most part. Um, from the first page of results. We still have work to do around Latina girls and Asian girls. So, you know, I make the direct appeal always that um, the challenge here is that we can suppress or push down results in different kinds of systems, in different kinds of algorithmically driven systems. And that happens at the level of kind of moderation, people who go in and do the work of um, deselecting or um, reprioritizing along different kinds of values, but that is very difficult to automate. And, um, and so I think these are the kinds of lessons that I've learned in studying search for a long time is to think about um, what kind of values drive an algorith algorithmically driven system and how do we design um, systems that are sensitive to that. And of course, over the years, I've been asked lots of questions. You know, there's always like a story about Netflix. You know, Netflix, um, uh, why does Netflix algorithm only give me African-American content when I'm African-American, when I like to watch like When Harry Met Sally too, And, you know, all these different kinds of scenarios where these different types of ways of understanding who users of systems are, how to do some level of customization with the very rough course kinds of data points that can be collected about um, people who engage with these systems. And then of course, how to get it right. And um, you know, the answer is that's really hard. Um, so these, are, these issues are really important because they spread beyond of course, just um, the representation of people of color in these systems. And I find this really important because one of the challenges that's happening here in this scenario and in other scenarios where we see the failures is that um, these kinds of results are really connected to a long history of dehumanization of black women and girls. And the, it's the dehumanization of people that is so profoundly implicated in all other kinds of forms of violence, systemic violence that happen against people in the world. So it isn't just about like that we got the results wrong. It's really like, what are we curating and designing for? And of course, there's never been more attention on this than in the United States where we've been having antitrust hearings, calling in Facebook, Google, um, you know, kind of um, Amazon, you know, all of the major tech companies to talk about the values that are embedded in their systems and um, who is harmed. And of course, I know that some of the um, arguments are often that, you know, it's uh, such a small number of people. I mean, people argue with me all the time. They're like, Safia, you know, the internet is democratic and maybe this just reflects what the majority of people are looking for. And one of the questions I always ask back is, why is it for years that when black girls were pornified, you didn't have to add the words porn, you didn't have to add the word sex, black girl children became synonymous with pornography. So just at a fundamental kind of level of um, metadata and organization, we have some real problems here. But also what happens, and this is one of the things I really try to interrogate in the book, what happens when your system um, doesn't account for people who are in minoritized communities. 
So, you know, if the logic is that the majority is looking for something or doing something that really doesn't help people who, again, might not be of age, might be vulnerable, might let be less connected, um, and also who have to bear the brunt and the harm that comes from these long histories of dehumanization. And I think those are the kinds of things, because of course, these results link up to uh, many other kinds of results. In fact, this, this kind of narrative of the um, hypersexualization of, of black girls is very old. Um, I really invite you to uh, look at through the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia uh, at your leisure where you can really understand the long histories of racist stereotyping that happen in the United States context. And of course, then that gets exported all over the globe, right? Those, kind of, those stereotypes can emanate here. And they are, those stories are kind of, they emanate from real social and political and economic realities. So for example, here's a postcard from the early 20th century of um, this is a stereotype of a black girl child. Um, the stereotype is called the pickaninny. Um, some of you have probably seen these images in your um, societies and the countries where you live. Um, this is kind of a fundamental part of um, what we call Americana in the United States. This is a fundamental part of kind of the racist history of the United States. And um, this image, you know, at the top of this postcard, this is a postcard that might've gotten mailed, you know, around the country where people would just like, hey, I'm thinking about you, send a note off um, on a postcard like this. And at the top of this postcard, you can see in this image of this kind of sexualized child, um, the headline says, honey, I'm waiting for you, right? In this kind of provocative way. And again, this is like a sexualized toddler um, or young child. So these images are really important because they have they take a hold. I won't I won't I don't have time now. I wish I could teach you kind of a, a master class on racist stereotypes in the United States, but I will just say that if you go to the Jim Crow Museum, you can read more deeply. Part of these reason that stereotypes um, and distortions of culture happen is because they work in service of some type of social control, right? Patricia Hill call, kill, Collins calls these controlling images. Um, in her important work, um, uh, Black Feminist Thought. And so um, these controlling images are very important because there are many kinds of controlling images, particularly in, uh, in and around um, entertainment industries. I mean, this is a place where there has been a profound struggle for almost a hundred years in the United States, really since the advent of the racist propaganda film, Birth of a Nation, that, um, African-Americans specifically have, but also Latinos and indigenous people, women have been struggling so hard against um, misrepresentative narratives and images of, of culture. And um, uh, um, I think these are really important things to take up in, in uh, all communities that are kind of responsible for making culture visible. Now, um, these ideas about kind of how um, flawed systems are enacted, extend beyond the realm of like um, ethnicity and culture. Um, here was a story, uh, a, a research that took hold, kind of started in 2013, um, was reported on for a couple of years, which was really about the way in which um, search engines in particular could uh, um, effectively determine the outcome of political elections by the way in which certain types of stories got reported on the first page of search. And of course, I think about this, not just to think about Google search, but to think about all kinds of algorithm, algorithmically driven platforms that can only make visible so much on a screen you know, the smaller the screen, the smaller the device, the, the, the more limited the amount of result that can be shown. Um, and what are the kind of values that go into a ranking algorithm, for example? Um, you know, I always try to teach my library science students about ranking um, and prioritization because they're in the business of, you know, uh, they will be cataloging and classifying all kinds of knowledge. And um, you know, in the library environment, you can walk the stacks, you can walk into different libraries in one, like at UCLA, we have dozens of different kinds of specialized libraries, you can walk into those brick and mortar spaces. Um, 
and you can browse, which is very different than a database driven kind of knowledge system where things are ranked and ordered from one to you know, a million. And in the cultural context that most of us live in, uh, you know, to be ranked number one is to be the best, is to be the most important. Right. So there's a, a tremendous amount of responsibility for thinking about what does it mean in the cultural context of to be number one is to be thought of as the best, as to be uh, credible, curated, vetted. Um, that puts a huge onus, I think, on systems that are using those types of logics. And of course, in the political realm, when negative stories about political candidates are on the first page of search, this um, uh, means that uh, in this study, for example, that Epstein and Robertson um, conducted in 2013, that people are not willing to vote for those candidates. And if positive stories show, then they are willing. And so the, the role of capital and political action committees um, and those who have an incredible amount of technical prowess is very important because that really affects what is made visible. And I would point you here to the work of um, my colleague, Jesse Daniels, a uh, professor at Hunter College in the CUNY system who wrote a very important canonical book called Cyber Racism, where she looks at the technical dimensions of internet-based systems and how they privilege and give more voice to um, white supremacist ideas and content. And so her book is really important. So when we think about um, this relationship between people who are already marginalized and people who have more voice versus less voice. I think this is a really important kind of um, ecosystem to study. <clears throat> Never was this more important than immediately following the 2016 presidential election when the first result in the couple of days following um, <clears throat> when you did a, final, a search on final election results, um, you were led to a disinformation site that reported out that Donald Trump had won the popular vote. Now we know that this is not true. We know that Hillary Clinton had in fact won the popular vote by 3 million votes, but um, Donald Trump had won the electoral college. So these things are important when we talk about again, fact setting um, and the loss of factual realities, the loss of evidence-based realities that we, um, work so hard around the world to try to connect. Um, of course, the role of science and um, truth is so important in thinking about how systems come to represent reality. And really that's what this um, conversation is, really, is about more than anything, more than the specifics. It's like, how do large scale systems come to represent particular kinds of truths or realities? Um, in the case of, um, you know, talking about to uh, tech leaders about, you know, the implications of their work, one of the challenges is that oftentimes tech company leaders will say, you know, if we are to interfere with the results that come out of our systems, that's bad technology practice. And so here in the case of when white supremacists or neo-Nazis um, co-opt certain kinds of terms, um, when they're able to really mobilize around certain kinds of metadata, which they have an incredible amount of technical skill. These communities around the world, they're very well networked and organized thanks to um, platforms like um, Twitter and Facebook, um, Gab, others, Discord. Um, when they're able to kind of monopolize certain types of keywords, they really are able to control particular narratives. And this is really important that the sector, I think, not disavow its responsibility for having systems that can be manipulated in this way, but rather think about um, what kind of safety has to be in place for the public when they engage with these kinds of systems and what is the role of systems in fomenting hate and other kinds of harm in society. And really to me, that's the point of um, the work that, that I'm trying to do. Um, we know that um, people are involved. These systems are not fully automated. The work of my colleague, Sarah Roberts um, at UCLA and her important book, Behind the Screen, um, MacArthur Genius, Mary Gray and her book, um, Ghost Work, really help, helping us understand that there are legions of people around the world who must intervene with these systems and do moderation and must make kind of values choices um, in order to um, think about the integrity of what happens in these systems. And so this is really important. I think that we bring more of that work out into the light and try to think more um, holistically about the interventions that can be made by human beings. 
As I start to close here, I'll just say that, um, you know, one thing that I always try to um, stress to so many audiences is that social inequality, the kinds of things that we're concerned about are not going to be solved at the level of the app. You know, we're really fixated. I'm here in California. I'm a native Californian. I live right down the street from Silicon Beach. Um, you know, we understand this impulse to want to um, automate problem solving. And um, that impulse is so strong that somehow we think that social inequality will, will be solved, you know, like tapping a piece of glass on a piece of hardware. And I think we have to really reimagine what the sector broadly can do. And there are so many different ways in which um, the sector has to be talking to, uh, companies have to be talking to each other. Um, you know, I was at an Anti-Defamation League um, sponsored event uh, a while back uh, around um, what happened in Charlottesville with the um, kind of uh, organization of white supremacists who took over Charlottesville a couple of years ago. And one of the things that was so interesting is that um, there were kind of companies that aren't necessarily seen as like maybe part of the big six tech companies who saw things happening. So for example, Airbnb was one of the first companies to see what was happening. And um, because they had people who were trying to reserve houses and accommodation in Charlottesville who were explicitly saying they did not want to stay anywhere where near black people in a house that was owned by black people, they start, you know, they were really specific um, that alerted the company that there, that a white supremacist rally was being, which of course we know um, resulted in the murder of, uh, of a young woman. So we, they were able to see that, but it was so difficult. Of course, PayPal, other like payment processing companies were also able to see what was happening in their systems and where where things like where money was being sent to white nationalist organizations. We have Cloudflare, um, you know, web hosting platform who could see what was happening. Um, these companies often are not in any kind of consortia to talk to each other, to share, to um, respond to various types of crises. And so this is another invitation that I would just offer that we certainly have been trying to do at UCLA, um, but thinking more comprehensively about how companies need to be engaging with each other um, much more rigorously um, to intervene. The last thing I'll say is that, you know, my work has been moving toward thinking about um, what does the sector owe back to the public? You know, one of the challenges is that the sector, I mean, it, it it, for the most part, doesn't pay taxes. It offshores its profits. It, it takes the cream of the crop of the best um, students uh, and graduates from universities to go and work in their companies. And it, it kind of has its, its lack of participation in the public sphere, mainly through its investment in the public sphere. And that investment comes through things like paying taxes and being good neighbors at, at local municipal levels. Um, not contributing to gentrification, all of these kinds of really profound, important social issues. When the sector is separated from its understanding of the role that it's playing, it really erodes um, what I think of as kind of the democratic institutional counterweights that are so important in society too. So we see a crisis in K through 12, a crisis in higher education, a crisis of public media, a crisis of public health, much of which has to do with a loss of revenue into those systems. And those systems are so important for democracy. I mean, there is a role, of course, for um, industry, but there's a really important role for democratic institutions to also um, play in the space and be strengthened. And I wanna just remind us of how incredibly important um, uh, uh, that is to do. So I've been writing about this. This is an article I wrote for Noema Magazine. Um, if you're interested in those conversations, one of the things that I'm arguing about the new paradigm is that we have to think about what, how other eras and moments. So pulling back from like, how do we fix data and thinking back much more broadly, architecturally long-term. So here I invite us to think about, and this is kind of the subject matter of a new book I'm writing now. Um, what was it about the era of big cotton, for example, when we had so many parallel arguments that we have to, today to the tech sector, which is 
It's um, uh, big cotton and big ag um, are embedded uh, throughout every sector of the economy. Our economy, our, the American economy um, will collapse without the transatlantic slave trade. It will collapse without the institution of slavery because big cotton was in fact predicated upon those. The entire, you know, um, kind of early US economy was so tied profoundly to these institutions that people argued they could not be dismantled or it would be the undoing of the, of the country. And I wanna remind us that it was a small handful of people who really challenged that and use the logics of the enlightenment, quite frankly, back on to um, lawmakers and onto industry to say, this is untenable. You know, these ideas about um, full participation, you know, all, all men being created equal. It's the same that women, uh, the women's movement did, which was exploiting this idea, leveraging this contradiction that somehow all men were made equal, but women and people of color weren't. And so really understanding like what are the words that are being used and what are the paradigms that exist. And similarly in the era of big tobacco, you know, my students cannot believe, like sometimes I'm like, are her, yeah. The doctor who delivered me had a cigarette hanging from his mouth when I was getting pushed out. Like there, anybody born in the 70s, 100% that was happening. My mom probably chain smoked two packs of cigarettes like right in the hospital bed. There's no question about it. So how, my students can't believe this now. Some of you probably can't believe this because you're young enough to be like, what are you talking about? But this, is, this, was, this was the paradigm that we lived in under big tobacco where there was so much kind of hype about, you know, big tobacco makes you skinny. It makes you a better person. It'll make you better everything. Um, and, and there was a lot of research, cherry picked research that was funded by big tobacco to hold up those arguments too. And yet it took, it took class action lawsuits to, against the industry to really break that apart and say, there is harm, there's secondary harm, there's tertiary harm. Um, we have to be responsible with this sector. And I think that those same kinds of logics could be applied to big tech where we say, let's get serious about where the harms are. Let's get serious about the discourses that we use that these things are here to stay. It's a fait accompli. Let's figure out what needs to um, stay and what needs to go. And I think these are some of the kind of new possibilities that I want to invite because we're in this moment where everyone cares about ethics. We're talking, we have millions of people in the streets talking about racial justice, economic justice. Um, it's, a, it's a really profound and important opportunity for us to be thinking about um, where things have gone awry and what things should stay and what things maybe should go. The last thing I'll say as I close is that, you know, we have more data and technology than ever. Um, this was the promise, right? That if we had more data, if we had more technology, that somehow that would be the, the equalizer. Um, but the truth is that since we've been collecting uh, records on social inequality, every year we eclipse the year before. And we now have more social, political, and economic inequality and injustice to go with all of that big data and tech. So I invite us to think about this relationship between um, the sector, the work that we're doing, the ways in which we're imagining and designing systems, um, the way in which we're influencing culture, and um, and reimagine what kinds of possibilities could be there. And that's really the work that I'm doing, that we're doing at the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. I invite you to um, stay in touch with us and I'm um, looking forward to our conversation now. And thank you. I always just one person clap because that's all I need. Okay, it's fine. All right, now we're good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um...